Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the Unitarian Church of Los Alamos. Whoever you are, wherever you are on your life's journey, whoever you love, whatever you believe, you're welcome here. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you to the um, our 22nd lecture in the Biblical Scholarship and Literacy series, uh, and we're on Leviticus, chapter 1 through 15. So it took us 23 lectures to make it to Leviticus. Uh, and we're going to, let's see, I want to remind everyone of uh, our webpage, um, sites.google.com, view biblical scholarship and literacy, uh, and that will give you a link to uh, past lectures, recommended reading, all that sort of wonderful stuff. Uh, and it also has a calendar on it, which I try to keep updated. Uh, most recently, we've been using the RE calendar, and so my stuff is actually on the RE calendar, which should tell you the dates, because they're going to move a little, around a little bit in November and December, especially to avoid Christmas and, uh, and Thanksgiving. So uh, last time, last month, we, we talked about the book of Exodus, uh, one of many lectures on the book of Exodus, but specifically, we covered the golden calf. These are your gods of Israel who brought you up out of the land of Egypt uh, in 1 Kings. It is then repeated in Exodus where they set up a golden calf, but then say these, plural, are your gods, which seems to make the, the story itself a commentary on the story in 1 Kings. Uh, and we talked about the authorship and said, if you remember the, the authorship stuff, that this was J and E. If you don't remember that, we'll, we'll cover authorship a little bit more to help you get back into that as we go into Leviticus, but this was a J.E. story and not a P story. Whereas the stuff on either side of it, uh, the, the instructions for the tabernacle and the building of the tabernacle were probably written by P, and then we have this interjection of the golden calf from J and E. So today, let's uh, start with an introduction to the book of Leviticus. Uh, I'll cover the first 15 chapters, but I'll also kind of introduce you to the book as a whole. Um, Here's my plan. If everything goes according to plan, and I don't make things larger, longer, take longer than I think, go into more depth than I think. Uh, originally, I was thinking of doing it in two classes, and I decided to divide it into three. It's just easier to do this in smaller chunks. But we'll cover 1 through 15 today and an introduction. Leviticus 16 will get a class of its own. That's the Day of Atonement ritual. And that'll be a lot of fun because we'll cover some Egyptian and Babylonian stuff along with it, which is why it'll get its own kind of thing. And then uh, we'll cover the last half of Leviticus in December. And those are the dates, presumably, uh, November 20th and December 18th, which are, the, again, the third Sunday and the fourth. So the book of Leviticus. So that name, what does it mean, Leviticus? Um, Leviticus means things pertaining to the Levites. It comes from a Latin translation of the Greek here, which basically says Leviticon, the things pertaining to the Levites. Um, the problem is uh, the, one of the, the, the Jews have two names for this. Uh, one is the priest's instructions, or instructions to the, the priest, Tohat Kohanim. Tohat is like Torah, the law, or the instructions to the Kohan. If any of you have a friend whose last name is Kohan, the Kohans are, are the traditionally um, the, the, the family of the priests. So these are the things pertaining to the priests. That is actually a better description of the book than Leviticon. The book mentions Levites, but only does it once. It's mostly about the priests. And if you don't know what the difference is between a Levite and a priest, we'll get into that in just a minute. Uh, the, the traditional, though, Hebrew name for the book is va, um, va, Vaikra. Vaikra, I want to say that right. And he called. Uh, in Hebrew, the, the and is a prefix, and he called is a suffix. It's how you conjugate the, the verb. So it's and he called is one word, Vaikra. And, and there's a tradition in Hebrew to name all the books of the Bible after the first word of the, of the book, like Genesis Barashit in the beginning. Um, and this is, and he called. Uh, in this case, the first word actually has some meaning for the text, uh, because the book begins with, and he, God, uh, Yahweh, called to Moses and spoke to him saying. Uh, and so uh, that, that phrase is repeated uh, uh, 12 times three times in the book of Leviticus. And it can be broken up into separate instances where God calls to Moses from the tabernacle and gives him instructions for how to worship God. And so that is, uh, that is kind of the, the, the content of this book, the first word, the Jewish name for it, and it has some, some kind of uh, reflection of the meaning of the book. So I said it has more to do with priests and Levites. What's the difference? All Israelites, uh, all, all Levites are Israelites, but not all Israelites are Levites. Levites are members of the family of Levi, according to the text. 
Uh, and we, again, we've talked about the historicity of some of that. We don't know how accurate this is, but uh, Jacob supposedly had 12 sons. One of them was named Levi, and Le the Levites are the children of Levi. They serve in the tabernacle in, in a, in a help, helping role. They, they carry the things and they help set things up. Uh, and so they're kind of temple servants or temp, temple, all of them are temple servants, it's a better word, uh, temple helpers. Uh, kind of like in an Episcopal church today, you might have a, some, some deacons and then, and then some uh, altar uh, helpers. These are, these are the altar helpers. Um, similarly, all priests are Levites, but are they're supposed to be. There's some stories in the Bible where they ordain people as priests who aren't Levites, and that's always looked down on. But all priests are supposed to be Levites. But again, not all Levites are priests. Um, priests are supposed to be, and according to the, the biblical tradition, one of the biblical traditions, priests are supposed to be descendants of Aaron. There is another tradition where descendants of Moses, Moses' kids, other than Aaron, are allowed to be priests. And those two traditions actually uh, fought over time. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Do these groups, uh, are these groups allowed in their tradition to intermarry? Yes, uh, but, but they pass down, uh, well, it's confusing. Uh, Israelite descent passes down through the mat maternal line. Uh, at least in later is Judah, because Judah, you know who the mother is, you're not quite sure who your dad is, right? Um, and so it passes down through the, the female line, but the priests uh, would pass down through the male line. Uh, and so uh, especially the, the, the high priest was kind of the, the, the birthright son of Aaron. So again, the children of Levi are the Levites. Moses and Aaron are both Levites. Aaron is Moses' brother. Children of Aaron are supposed to be the priests. There are some children of Moses who are also priests, and those two groups tended to fight about authority. Uh, and the, the, the eldest son of Aaron uh, was the high priest. Now, uh, so this is the things pertaining to the priests, meaning Aaron and his children who would offer the sacrifices, etc. cetera. Uh, and that's the meaning of the book of Leviticus. Uh, and by the way, uh, E seems to be related to a group who, who had Mosite, Moshite, Mosesite, uh, priesthood descent, and they wrote E. And so you'll notice in E, Aaron is responsible for the golden calf. It's his fault. Uh, and we'll see in P, they'll tell a story where they have a, a, a story that's similar to the golden calf, except it's two of Aaron's sons who do it, and two other of Aaron's sons then inherit instead. But Aaron is blameless, and the two sons that inherit that they do trace their lineage to are blameless. So each of them have their own kind of fall story. But in E, it's, Mo, it's Aaron's fault, and in, in P, it's two of Aaron's kids' fault, and, and not Aaron himself or the, the, the chosen line of Aaron. All right. So we'll, another way to think about uh, the book of uh, Leviticus that might help us, in, in especially, uh, I, we may have some more familiarity with other religions than, than most people who approach the biblical text. So for us, if you, especially if you've been to some of my comparative religion classes, you may, have, you may remember my class on Hinduism. Uh, the book of Leviticus reminds me of the Vedas. It's a book that describes what's clean and what's not. It describes uh, 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 layers of holiness for different people, almost like a caste system, uh, although it has less of the ethical implications because there's no rebirth. So, uh, and and the, you know, the unclean people are, are like the untouchables, and, uh, and, and the high priest gets to go into the temple and officiate with God, but, but there's less of this kind of uh, ethical implications. Uh, in the text, um, but it also has these zones of holiness for people, much like the Vedas, and it has a list of rituals and, per, and things that you, and hymns that, that you, you do to cleanse yourself of impure, impurity. So this book is an awful lot like the Hindu Vedas. They're, they're very different in many ways, but they have some similarities, and that's maybe one good way to get your head around what, what is in Leviticus. So uh, if I try to, I, one of the ways to deal with this is to break it up into pieces and try to see the chunks. So uh, I think, yeah, right here, we have the first half is written by P, and it's the rules for the priests. The, the next, and it ends in chapter 16, which is the Day of Atonement, which will get its own class. And so today we'll cover the first bit of that and then leave the last chapter for next month, and then the next month we'll cover the next chunk, which is the Holiness Code, and then followed by this addendum, which has stuff about vows, dedications, and tithes. Uh, there is a, a general consensus that P and H are related, much more intimately related than the other authors of the text that we've seen, but there, there is a distinction, a slight distinction, and, and uh, you can see it as we go through P, and then in, in a few months as we go through H, you'll see slight differences in how they think about things. 
Um, but for now, it's enough to know that, that P is primarily a, a concerned about temple purity. You have to be pure so that God will live with you in the temple. H is more concerned about how the nation of Israel has to be pure so they don't get kicked out of the land, uh, which makes sense, especially if H is written after the, the, uh, after the, uh, the exile where they didn't get to stay in the land. And this may be H's explanation for why they were kicked out and therefore what they have to do to return. Uh, so P, if we break up P into several, several parts, we have um, seven chapters on sacrifices. And then eight through 10, we have the dedication of the temple and the priests and the transgression of Aaron's sons. This is P's version of the golden calf uh, event. And then we have in 11 through 6, all this stuff about ritual purity, culminating in the Day of Atonement, how you cleanse ritual purity uh, from, the temp from the temple itself. Uh, so this is, uh, if you're familiar with uh, kosher laws, a lot of that comes from 11 through 16 that the Jews still keep today. The, the source of that is 11 through 16. Um, so the story kicks off with the Tent of Meeting in Leviticus chapter 1. And I am not going to read, reread the stuff we did last time. But if you remember last time, and if you didn't, it's all right. But if you were here and you remember last time, there was this section on the tent of meeting in E. Remember? Uh, Moses goes out to the tent of meeting. And, and if we remember what the tent of meeting was like, it existed before the tabernacle was built. It was outside the camp, whereas the tabernacle is inside the camp. Uh, and it was presided over by a guy named Joshua and Moses. Joshua and Moses would hang out there. Joshua is not a Levite. So you'll notice authority to connect with God extends to a group of people more broadly than just the Levites and the priests, especially more broadly than just the Aaronite priests. Well, that's a story from E. In P, when he talks about the tent of meeting, it is identical to the tabernacle itself. And so for P, only Levites get to go in and only high priest gets to go in the center, right? So um, this is one of the ways we know that P and E are different sources. Um, so the very first verse is, the Lord summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, note that there's our tent of meeting. Right? And again, notice that in this case, it's the tabernacle of Moses. Um, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them. Now again, that, that's that phrase that is repeated 36 times. Speak to the people of Israel and speak unto them, saying, when any of you bring an offering of livestock to the Lord, you shall bring your offering from the herd or from the flock. If the offering is a burnt offering. Now here we have a, a long list of different types of offerings. And this is confusing. And I'm going to admit before I start that I don't have a terribly good handle on this. There are several offerings. Um, they have Hebrew names. And the author here assumes you know what they are. And it's giving details for how to do each offering. But it doesn't spend a lot of time explaining the differences between the offerings other than how they're performed in terms of what they were for, if that makes sense. So we know what they are. We know how they're performed. We know how they're different. We have to kind of infer what they're for a little bit. Uh, he tells us some things, but, but again, these distinctions are kind of vague and they're confusing and I don't have a good handle on it. Maybe that's because I haven't studied it hard enough, um, but it also may be that it's just confusing and, and people don't really know for sure. Um, but I'm going to do my best to make sense of this. There are two types, volitionary sacrifices and mandatory sacrifices. Uh, and um, the volitionary ones will say, you, you will bring or you must bring. But they mean when you do a volitionary sacrifice, this is how you must do it. So the must in there don't mean the sacrifice is mandatory. It means you must do it this way when you do it. So these are the sort of sacrifices you do when you want to, when you want to give thanks or when you want a special blessing from God. Right? This is how, what I assume. These are, these are how you do. These are sacrifices you offer when you want something or you want to thank God for something. But they're not required. And then there's the mandatory sacrifices. These are required, and they're in four through six. And the reason they're required, presumably, is because these are the things you have to do to cleanse yourself of the impurity that would otherwise make the tabernacle itself impure and would therefore damage God's ability to live with the people. Uh, and then again, after those two sections, we have instructions. So you'll notice that the second bit here is, is repetitive, almost re re repetitive of the first. And the reason it's repetitive is that the first is kind of instructions to the people about bringing different offerings. And the next is instructions for the priests about how to do the offerings when the people bring them. But they kind of repeat the, the offering uh, lists in that second chunk. So um, burnt offerings. Uh, chapter 1, verse. Uh, let's start in um, verse 3. 
it says, if the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, you shall offer a male without blemish. You shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of the meeting for acceptance on your behalf before the Lord. And you shall lay your hand, hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be acceptable in your behalf as an atonement for you. So notice two things happened here. The first is, um, if it's from the, from the um, herd, and then in verse 10, if it's from the flock, and then in verse 14, if it's a burnt offering of birds. So there's several ways to make a burnt offering, and there's three chunks. We're not going to read them all. We're just going to do the first one. But if you're going to offer a burnt offering of these different types, you do it in different ways. But if it's from the, from the herd, it's a male without blemish. That is important in the sense that later Christian authors will tie this to Jesus, male without blemish, and, and they'll apply this to, to Jesus. Um, but here it meant uh, uh, pure, right? It, mean, it means good. It means you don't, you don't take the one with the broken leg and sacrifice it to God. You take the one that's healthy um, because God deserves the best. Um, and, you, and then notice that you lay your hands on it. And this has is, this is generated a certain amount of commentary. But um, in general, I think what's happening here is your hands represent what you do. And you put it on the head of the animal. That represents its authority. And you're basically putting your, your actions on its head. And it, and it represents you. You're sacrificing yourself to God. And you're letting this animal represent you. And that's, I think, what it means by it'll be acceptable on your behalf before the Lord. Here we have a substitutionary thing. This is the same thing we saw with Abraham and Isaac. Uh, and so I believe substitutionary theology, it, it, not in the sense of Jesus, as a subs but, but substitutionary theology itself is present in the Old Testament. And I know that's debated. People argue about it. I see it everywhere. And so I, I, I really think it's here. This, this thing represents you and dies on your behalf, so you don't have to. Uh, and then the bull, verse 5, it says, The bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord and Aaron's sons, and the priest shall offer the blood, dashing the blood against all the sides of the altar that is at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. And the burnt offering shall be flayed and cut up into parts, and the sons and the priests of Aaron shall put the fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons and the priests shall arrange the parts with the head and the suet on the wood that is on the fire of the altar. And its entra but, but its entrails and legs have to be washed with water first because they're not clean. And then the priest shall turn the whole into smoke on the altar as a burnt offering, an offering of fire, pleasing odor to the Lord. And there's this, these are the parts, uh, this is called a burnt offering specifically because you burn all of it. Uh, and it's a fire of pleasing smoke to the Lord. Uh, we have Greek texts that actually make this very explicit. God's kind of sitting up on a cloud, breathing in the smoke, and God eats the animal. You're feeding the animal to God by burning it. And so this allows you to have a communal meal with God. You send the, the animal up to God in smoke, and then you, uh, you eat other parts, uh, other things that are offered, and you end up with a communal meal with the deity. But the way you feed the deity is you burn it, turn it into smoke, and send it up, up to God. That doesn't mean that they literally thought that. It means at least that it's, it's a symbolic act of feeding the Lord. Or they literally believed it. It depends probably on how educated the individual was who was involved in Israelite religion. Some of the people probably thought God literally ate it by smelling the smoke. Others probably thought that it was a symbolic act of, of communal meals with God. Again, it depends. It's very hard to, to, to give a specific answer for how all of this works, because it's diverse. Um, and then again, we have from the flocks and from the, from the birds. Um, but that's chapter, chapter one, these burnt offerings that are fed to God. In chapter two, we have grain offerings. When anyone or a priest, uh, a grain, uh, when anyone presents a grain offering to the Lord, the offering shall be of choice flour. The worshipful shall, shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron and his sons and his priests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then this is eaten, as I recall, by the priests. Uh, I don't remember if it's eaten by the priests and the people or just the priests. I can't remember. should have paid attention. Um, I'll have to look that up. But let's move to uh, chapter 3, has offerings on well-being. These are different than the burnt offerings. Uh, these are made, can be male or female, without blemish to the Lord. Chapter 4, we have these what are called um, sin offerings. And this one is deceptive. If you look at the things you offer sin offerings for, and the, the things that, that say cleanse you of sins, and what those are for, the term sin here is, can, is uh, I don't know if mistranslated is the right word, but it's deceptive. 
because we think of sin as, as doing something morally wrong. Uh, these people are, are thinking of it as cleansing you from something that made you impure. It's a cleansing ritual of some sort. And so uh, the Day of Atonement cleanses you from sin. But again, sin is a broader category. It can be an ethical, for, for, for this text, sin is a broader category. It can be an ethical transgression, but it can also be an accidental a thing you did wrong, transgressing a holiness boundary. It can also have to do with just impurity, ritual impurity, like the sort that you might see in a Zoroastrian text or, uh, or a Hindu text. And this is how you cleanse yourself of all of these impurities, not just behaving badly in a moral sense. Um, so these are our sin offerings. And these are now mandatory, right? Because sin accumulates this uncleanliness, and if you don't clean it up, it will pollute the sanctuary, pollute the, the, the temp tabernacle, and you'll no longer, God will no longer dwell with Israel if you don't clean these up. And this is how you clean it up. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, again, another one of those, you know, 36 um, phrases, speak unto the people of Israel, saying, when anyone sins unintentionally in any of the Lord's commandments about the things not to be done, and does any one of them, um, and, and if he's anointed priest, etc. And then you go into all these details. And the details aren't important. Uh, they are important, but, but we don't we can't go into them, and they're complicated, right? But, but here's all, in chapter 4 will be all these uh, instructions. It will also have instructions for what's called a guilt offering. Um, these sin offerings are, are, again, purification from uncleanliness. The guilt offering has more of a, ref, a reference to anything that actually requires reparation. In other words, you've done something that hurts somebody. So you give reparations to your neighbor, and then you turn around and you give reparations to God. And this, is, this offering is the reparation to God. It's not the cleansing so much as the reparation to God. At least this is my understanding of the distinction between the sacrifices. As I said, there's a lot there that I'm not quite sure I've got my head wrapped around uh, completely. Um, one of the things that will come up all the time in these texts are these degrees of sacredness or holiness. Remember we had the Israelites, the Levites, and the priests? But we also have uh, these three degrees of holiness for the sacrifice itself. Um, there's burnt offerings, which are only eaten by God, because all the smoke goes up to God. There's grain purification and reparation offerings. Well, there's the answer to my earlier question. Grain offerings are eaten uh, by the priests and God. They're all listed as most holy. So the burnt offering is so holy that no, nothing is given. The, the, the uh, grain offerings are most holy. And then you get these well-being offerings that can be eaten by, be eaten by priests and Levites, and they're just listed as, as holy. So you get these three degrees of, of holiness, the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the well-being offerings. Uh, the purification reparation, excuse me. Um, and uh, we, have, we have similar things in the tabernacle, right? You have the courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies. We have similar, similar things on the Mount Sinai. You had the, the bottom of the mountain. You had further up the mountain where the, the priests go. And you have the top of the mountain where only Moses goes. And so this, this uh, division into three, and later in the Holiness Code, you'll see the, the land of the heathen, the land of, the, of Israel, and the temple are the three levels uh, in, in H. Um, we also ha saw them already, uh, well, in people. You, you can have the, Levite, the Israelite Levites and priests. You can also have uh, you know, the, the Gentiles, the Israelites, and the priests. But they will often list them in these kind of three degrees of increasing holiness. This, this is a theme that shows up all through um, the book of Leviticus. All right, so once we get ourselves through the sacrifice, then, and, and these are all instructions. No sacrifice is, is given here yet. Uh, and now in, in, uh, in chapter uh, 8, we begin with the ordination of the priests. And so I'm going I'm to read this in a little more detail because I find this stuff uh, terribly, terribly sacri uh, uh, fascinating. Um, so in verse eight, chapter 8, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying... Take Aaron and his sons with him, the vestments and the anointing oil, the bull of the sin offering, and two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread. So there's a list of things you need for this ritual. And assemble the whole congregation at the entrance to the tent of the meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded. Chapter 6, or verse 6. Then Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward, and he washed them with water. So when we talked about uh, these holiness things, in this pure and unpure, in, in both Zoroastrianism and Hinduism, and Buddhism, we've talked about washing, and, and it, you also see it in Islam. Uh, washing and in Christianity, baptism. Washing is an important ritual for getting rid of, of uncleanliness. You start by washing, 
And I think this has to do with the, the, the psychology behind this religious concept that is nearly universal. I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a bit, but uh, verse six, he brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water, and then he put the tunic on him and fastened the sash around him. So I'm, I'm gonna bring this stuff up. Uh, I can bring it up where people can see here. Um, let's see if I can tilt this down so people can see online too. Um, so you put the white tunic on him, that's, that's this part, it also comes with, with breeches. Uh, Let's see. Put the tunic on him, fastened the sash around him, and clothed him with the robe, and put the ephod on him. This, this blue piece here is the robe. It has bells and pomegranates, uh, uh, tassels that are in the shape of pomegranates on the bottom. Uh, this is the sash, and this, this apron-like piece here is the ephod. So you put the holy clothes on him, and put the ephod on him, and then put the decoration band of the ephod around him, tying the ephod to him. And then he placed the breastplate on him, and the breast piece he put the urim and the thummim. This is the, the breastplate. And, and what is this bizarre urim and thummim bit? Yeah, so, uh, well, turns out we don't actually know what the urim and thummim are. Uh, one interpretation is this breastplate itself is the urim and thummim, and uh, the, there's a pocket here in the breastplate we know, in, in the, the, the piece here, you know, the cloth for the breastplate. And on one interpretation, you can take this thing, fold it over, and cover. And that's actually how I've designed it. I can fold this over, uh, and you can take this inner piece, and you could fold it over from underneath, and you can cover up the breastplate uh, itself. So the breastplate could be the Urim and Thummim. Um, Urim and Thummim means the, the light and perfections, the glory or the light of the priest, right? So maybe you can cover this whole thing. And the breastplate is the Urim and Thummim. But one of the things we know about it is it means light and perfections, which gemstones might easily represent. But the other thing we know about it is it's used to, for divination. So somehow the priest used this to get revelation from God to decide what God wants. So if it's the breastplate itself, maybe he stares at it like a crystal ball and, and, and meditates until he sees a vision. But the other option is this, this thing actually forms a pouch when it's in the back, maybe it's folded up, the, uh, sewed up the sides. We don't actually know. And the priest could reach in here and pull out a black stone or a white stone, the Urim and the Thummim, and that would be a yes or no answer to a question. Uh, you said dice, that, that's another possibility if you cast bones or cast dice, or, but it's some sort of divination tool tied up with the clothes. And so Moses puts the Urim and Thummim on, on him. Um, the breastplate, he, in, in the breastplate, he put the Urim and Thummim. You see, it's something that goes in this breastplate piece, like almost like putting the stones in the breastplate or putting these two stones in, in the pocket that you draw out. Uh, but that's, that, that's literally all we know about the Urim and Thummim, and it's, it's frustrating and maddening because we wish we understood what this was all about. Um, and then it says, but, but notice the author isn't trying to hide it. The author just assumes you know, and, and we don't anymore. And he set the tunic on, uh, the, the turban on his head. This is this piece here. Um, and on the turban in the front, he set the golden ornament and the holy crown as the Lord commanded Moses. Th this is the, let me see if I can put this where people can see it. This is the, the golden ornament, and, and it says, uh, Kadosh Yahweh, holiness to the Lord. Uh, and and uh, my friend Michael helped me do this in Proto Hebrew, uh, written on the turban here. Uh, so, First thing you do when you, when you set these priests apart, remember what we're trying to do here is set the priests apart for service. And oh, well, by the way, I need to point out, Moses is doing all of this. This will be important for P, remember? P is, P is, uh, is the sons of, of Aaron are uh, primarily what P is about, right? And so it's written by uh, Aaronite priests, people who, um, who, who trace their ancestry to Aaron. And so Moses does this stuff, but he's doing it to Aaron. He's, it's almost for P, it's a transfer of power uh, from Moses to Aaron. Uh, and so th this is, again, part of the theology of P, uh, part, of the pol part of the politics of P. Let me find where I was at. Uh, and then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it, and he consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times, and he anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin of, uh, and the base 
to consecrate them. So to consecrate the tabernacle, you put oil on it, anointed, anointing oil. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. So the priests are anointed. Now, uh, this is important, uh, and, and it becomes important for later Christianity and other groups. Um, in, in, in Greek, Christ means anointed. Christ is the anointed one. And so Aaron, and what happens to Aaron is, a, is for Christians, a type of Jesus. Jesus is the anointed one, and to anoint means to set apart for a special purpose. In ancient Israel, three groups were anointed. Priests, prophets, and kings are all anointed with oil. Uh, and so uh, Jesus is sometimes called a priest and a king, um, and, and, and there's other references to being a kingly uh, people, uh, etc. So again, anointed with oil is important, to, not just to Israelite religion, but to later religion, uh, later religious groups that are inspired by this. And Moses brought forth Aaron's sons, and he clothed them with tunics and fastened sashes around them, and he tied the headdress on them as the Lord commanded Moses. So here I have a picture um, from uh, some other group's uh, uh, tabernacle model. Uh, they have both a tabernacle model and models of the clothes. And on the left is the high priest clothes, which I have here. And on the right is, is what they uh, conceive as a priest clothes. It's just the white tunic, kind of the same as the high priest. It also has a turban, but doesn't have the golden crown and it has uh, a sash. Whether that sash has the same you know, purple color as the high priest is, or not is unknown, but it's missing the blue robe and the ephod and the urim and thummim, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> then he leads forward the bull for a sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull, again, putting their, authority, their, their, their actions onto the head of the bull for a sin offering, and in this case, sin is, is to purify them from their ritual and cleanliness. And it was slaughtered. And Moses took the blood with his finger. Now, here we get something really weird. He puts uh, um, blood on each of the horns of the altar, purifying the altar, and then he poured out the blood on the base of the altar. Thus, he consecrated it. And then I'm going to skip over to verse uh, 23. And after another, uh, this is another, a ram is slaughtered. Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. And after Aaron's sons were brought forward, Moses put the sum of the blood on the lobes of their right ears and their thumbs of their right hands and the big toe of their right feet. And Moses dashed the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. So there's specific washing of, of the priest, clothing of, in robes, and anointing with oil, and then touching different parts of the body with blood uh, to, to set them apart. And, and in this case, this is interesting, as we see later, blood makes things unclean. And in this case, blood makes them clean. We also have references uh, to people who want to, to be slaves to a master forever. Maybe they really love their master. They can have a, an awl drilled into their, they can get it basically their ear pierced with an awl. And again, blood on the right, uh, right lobe of their ear. What almost seems to be happening here is Aaron is being becoming, because of the connection between this law and other laws we have surrounding slavery, um, Aaron is setting himself apart as the house servant. Servant, slave, work, worship. These things are all interchangeable because they use the same word in Hebrew. And so the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh, and they worked hard, and they cried unto God, and God set them free that they may worship me, worship, same word, on this mountain. And so God brings them forth out of slavery that they may serve God, again, same word. And so Aaron is setting himself apart as a servant for God, forever by, by touching the right, the right lobe. That one makes sense. The thumb and the big toe, I'm not quite sure, but I think it has something to do with all of the things you do and the places you go, right? Uh, Aaron becomes God's servant forever and dedicates all he has and all he is to God. Um, then verse 27, he placed all these on the palms of Aaron and the palms of his sons and raised them as an elevation offering before the Lord, specifically cakes of unleavened bread and, and oil. And so now there's a ritual where you take uh, a bunch of, of offerings and you wave them before the Lord. It's almost like you're, you're giving them to God. This may be left over from uh, Egyptian worship, uh, especially worship of the sun, where as the sun comes up, you raise your hands and you worship the sun. We have this, this uh, referenced all over in ancient Egypt. But there's these wave offerings. And Moses took them from their hands and turned them into smoke on the altar. So you wave them before the Lord and then you burn them and the smoke goes up to God. 
Then 30, Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled them on Aaron and his vestments and also on his sons and their vestments. And thus he consecrated their vestments and also the sons and their vestments. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, boil the flesh of the entrance of the tent of the meeting and eat it there with the bread that is in the basket. So some of the food, the first offering was burned and all of it. And now they have another one where they boil some of its meat and they eat it. This becomes a communal meal. So again, the other thing you do, you wash, you clothe, you anoint, you consecrate yourself to God, dedicate yourself as a servant to God forever. And remember the priests, especially like priests in Egypt, these were house servants to the gods. That's what Aaron becomes. You offer some of the food to God, then you get to eat some of it and you have a communal meal with deity. So there's something about sitting down with someone and eating together with them that, that puts you in communion with them. And you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of the meeting for seven days, until the day when the period ordination is complete, it will take seven days to ordain you a priest. Okay, that's it. It's complicated. It's this big, long ritual, but you can see kind of how it, how it represents this idea of being clean, being set apart, and belonging to God, giving yourself to God and belonging to him so that he then becomes in communion with you. And then chapter 9. Uh, in chapter 9, uh, Aaron starts offering sacrifice. Now, all this was Moses doing these things for Aaron, but now in chapter 9, again, this is P, Aaron and the priests start to do this for the people. So now Aaron gets to take over Moses' spot and do the things that Moses did. Right? So chapter 9 is a repeat of all this sort of stuff where he's offering calves and, and his sons are presenting blood to him on behalf of the people. So now Aaron is taking Moses' place. Um, then we get the strange uh, ver uh, story in chapter 10. This is, this is P's version of the golden calf. It's like they all had a, a memory that some ritual thing happened that was bad and God punished the people. And E and J, for E and J, it's the, it's the golden calf. And for P, this is the story. But I'm going to start back in chapter, um, chapter 9, verse 22. Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. This is the priestly sacrifice, this, uh, priestly blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his countenance to shine upon you and give you peace. He's, he's giving the priestly blessing. So after Aaron is set apart, now Aaron blesses, Moses blesses Aaron, Aaron blesses the people. And the verse 24, fire came out from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat of the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. This is the prequel to um, the, the priests of Baal, Elisha and the priests of Baal, where God lights the altar on fire. This, this is the first time that that presumably happens. And that's important, I think, for maybe interpreting what happens next. Chapter 10, Aaron's sons, Nahab and Abihu, each took his censer. A censer is a, a, a cup that you use to burn incense in. He took his censer and put fire in it. They put fire in it and laid incense on it. And they offered, quote, unholy fire before the Lord, such that he had not commanded them. No one has a clue what, some translations call it strange fire. No one knows what this means. Uh, possible translations are strange fire, unauthorized fire, or even foreign fire, like you're worshiping a foreign deity. Uh, but they did something wrong. And then it says, and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. So God gets mad and burns them to pieces. Um, th this is a great depiction of the, of the ethics and morality of God. So, sarcasm, insert sarcasm here. Um, they do something wrong and they get burned alive. But I, again, I think that for the Israelites, we want to put ourselves in their mind. Um, once you, just like I said with the golden calf, once you get everything to this point, everything is ready now. This is P's version of everything is ready for the proper worship of God, and they do it wrong, and God is angry. So the closer you get to God, the more dangerous it is. You have to do it right, or you get burned. The other thing that's interesting is if we want to try to interpret what they did wrong, we don't know, but there are a couple options. One is they put the fire in it themselves. In other words, the, the, the fire wasn't taken from the altar that was already lit from God. We have other references that say the altar fire, once it's lit by God, should never be allowed to go out. And uh, it's possible and, and reasonable to assume that they should have taken that fire. There's references in Isaiah to angels taking tongs from off of the altar uh, and, and using it to light the incense. So the fire for the incense is supposed to come from the altar of sacrifice. This they lit themselves. Maybe that's what they ritually did wrong. Um, the other option is that they're drunk because in a few verses, one of the commands will be uh, never go into the temple drunk 
And you have to wonder, why did he give that command right after this one? Well, maybe that's because that's what they did wrong. So th maybe they were drunk. Um, <laughs> the other option, though, is that, that the offering of incense was supposed to be done by the high priests, and then these are priests doing it. Um, there are two of them. There's only supposed to be one. Maybe they're doing it you know, wrong in that sense. Um, but but another, another really obvious answer to me is Israel spent most of its time fighting with people offering incense to other gods in Israel's temples. Uh, and specifically, Asherah was, was a major deal. This was the idea that God had a wife, which again, I don't have a problem with, but, but the biblical authors do. And the offering of incense to Asherah, this, this picture is, is, I've showed this before, this is an actual Israelite temple. Um, and on the left, we have an altar to Yahweh, and on the right, we have an altar to Asherah, Yahweh's wife. And so maybe there's two of them, so maybe what's happening is one is offering incense to Yahweh, one is offering incense to Asherah. That is something that Israel struggled with for most of its existence. And so it would make sense that the author might be um, referencing something that, you know, he would have seen in his own time, people doing this, this incense offering to Yahweh and Asherah together, which might have to do with the two of them, uh, which might explain what happens here. Uh, there is at least a connection between God lighting the altar on fire and then God lighting these two people on fire. Uh, the, the stories come back to back. Uh, again, this, this is, this is P's uh, golden calf story. Um, and these are all fall stories. One from J is the Garden of Eden, and the other from, from E, with a little bit from J, is the golden calf, and then this is P. And, and all of them have things in common. They have to do with a sacred place. They have to do with expulsion from the place. They're very carefully pulled out, and, and their bodies are expelled out into the, into the wilderness. Um, and they all have to do with death somehow. Like in, in, in the fall, death enters the world. Um, in the fall of Adam, in E and J, the, pre, the Levites go through and kill a bunch of the Israelites uh, for worshiping the golden calf. Not Aaron, whose fault it was. It's the other people, obviously, uh, for you know, reasons uh, understandable only to the authors. And then, of course, in P, this, this is the story we have. All of these things, I think, have a lot uh, to do with the exile. Right, where, where Israel does things that gets them kicked out of the promised land where a bunch of them die in the Babylonian attack and a bunch of them are exiled and they try to figure out what it is they did that got them exiled and what they can do to fix it so they can go back. Right, so I think a lot of this has to do with, with the historical exile but all these tell very similar and connected stories. All right, in 11 through 16 we have these rituals for purity and rules for purity. Uh, again, uh, If you've been taking my, to my comparative religion classes, you've seen this before. In Hinduism, which was in, you know, something we did back in 2018, uh, there's this modern Hindu ritual of people cleansing themselves from impurity. In Zoroastrianism, uh, where things like blood, sweat, spit, breath, uh, hair, all, all these things can make you unclean. The, you notice the, the, Hindu, or the uh, Zoroastrian priests are wearing a veil just to, to keep their, their own uh, exhalation uh, from we now know exhalation creates these you know spittles that go everywhere, right? That's why we wore masks during COVID. Um, but they're doing it for ritual reasons because they're trying to keep themselves ritually pure. And then they have these rituals for purifying themselves. This is a Zoroastrian teaching. This is a Hindu tradition. This is incredibly common. It is a little weird. Like why why can't a, a Jewish person uh, eat a hamburger? Right? What what's the problem with ham? Well, this idea that certain things are clean and certain things are unclean is is something that is not unique to them. It's all over the ancient world. And you could argue maybe if this is post-exilic, maybe they got it from, from their connection with Zoroastrianism in Persia when, when, when Cyrus takes over Babylon. But it's also possible, and I think more likely, that this is just in the air. This is how all these cultures thought. Uh, they're not borrowing from each other. They're all borrowing from, from the common culture. And I believe there's human psychology connected. I promised to talk about this human psychology of clean, unclean, and washing. Um, I believe, and I think there's a lot of good psychology that says that a lot of our morality, whether we consider something moral, has to do with our own ick uh, reaction. When you see something, you go ick for some things. And it, it's almost involuntary, just, it just happens. Some things, some things are gross, they, they, they gross us out. And, and when that happens, we attach as humans an ethical sense on top of it. And our sense of ethics and our sense of, of ickiness 
are inextricably linked. And we will often use logic to explain to people why things are good or bad, but we will invent whatever logic is necessary to make the things that make us feel icky bad and make the things that make us feel uh, non-icky good. Uh, the, our logic is a post, post, you know, a post reaction, not, not the actual source of our morality. Um, and, and what happens is there, there was an evolutionary advantage. Remember, these people do not understand the germ uh, theory of disease, but they did understand that some diseases are communicable. They don't know how. And so they know that something is passed invisibly from one unclean thing to another. And so there is an evolutionary advantage to people who find certain things that are likely to make you sick icky and who believe that touching those things transmits that ickiness to other things. And that gets expanded upon to ritual purity and to ethical purity both. H will have a lot more to say about ethical purity. For P, it's mostly ritual. But ethical and ritual purity become interconnected and intertwined in humans. This is a natural human thing. And so you need some way to cleanse yourself. Well, if you have touched something that could make something sick, you wash your hands, that helps. And so if you've touched something that could make you ritually unclean or ethically unclean, we impose that onto the same thing. You wash your hands and it helps. And on top of that is added, we need to make this God who we may have made angry. If you believe that, that, that you know, disease comes from an angry God, we've got to make that God unangry. And so you offer a sacrifice to the God. Sacrifice and washing become tied to making yourself clean from the things that make you go ick. Um, and for whatever reason, some people find certain animals more attractive and less attractive. We, these are cultural, right? Some, some people grow up eating snails and they think they're a delicacy. Other people look at snails and go, ooh, and then they don't want to eat snails. And so we don't know exactly where the Jewish, uh, how and why the Jews drew the lines they did, the ancient Israelites, not the Jews, right? the ancient Israelites drew the lines where they did in terms of what is clean and what is unclean. But there is probably cultural baggage that explains it, and it's probably cultural baggage that goes back much further than when the texts were written, which the texts are written later, but this cultural concept of what is clean and unclean is probably much older. And so we have this long list of animals that are clean, insects that are clean, fish that are clean, uh, things that live in the sea that aren't fish that are unclean, like shellfish, um, pork, is unclean, certain insects are unclean, and certain birds are unclean. There is some logic to some of it. Some of the birds are carrion eaters, and they're likely to make you sick. Uh, some of the animals, uh, I, there seems to be, uh, and I think P has a lot of this in his thinking, anything that breaks um, uh, uh, categories. P wants everything to fit neatly in categories, so when things break the categories, I mean, when they crawl like an insect but live in the water, no, right? Or, or if, if they, they, they chew the cud, but don't have their cat, their foot divided, well, that's, that's, that's the other, I don't remember which way that is, right? But, but for him, there's categories that things should follow, and when they don't follow the categories correctly, they become unclean. But again, we don't understand some of the reasons for some of this categorizing. Um, but there, there is a list of clean and unclean things, and this creates the entire kosher law. So we could spend forever reading these chapters to go through everything that's kosher or not, and if you were Jewish, I would do that so that you could make sure you could keep kosher. But I think for us, we're much more interested in what you do if you come in contact with something that's unclean. Verse 11, chapter 11, verses 24 and 25. Um, By these you shall become unclean. Whosoever touches the carcass of any of them shall be unclean until the evening. You don't have to just eat it. If you just touch it, you become unclean until the evening. And whosoever carries any part of the carcass of any of them shall wash his clothes and be unclean until the evening. That's it. You wash your clothes and you're unclean until evening. This is important, I think, because there is a concept that some of these things are just, you know, if you do them, you know, you have to think about a better way to say this. Christians will later look at this and say, it's impossible to keep all these laws. No one keeps them perfectly. Therefore, everyone is imperfect, and therefore, everyone is worthy of death, and we're all, we all should die, and we need Jesus Christ, and these sacrifices just don't cut it. 
But that, that is the later Christian interpretation. And they're getting it from these texts. So these texts are important for understanding Christianity. We're not here to critique, we're here to understand. A Jew would look at these texts, and all, we also should understand what they would say. Uh, uh, an ancient Israelite especially would look at these texts and say, no, you don't have to be perfect. Nothing in here says you have to be perfect. Nothing in here says you all have to die if you're not perfect. It says that if we allow the impurity to build up, and we're trying to dwell close to a holy God, we have to not let the impurity build up, or we could die. And so all you have to do is wash your clothes and wait some time, and you're clean. All you have to do is offer a sacrifice every once in a while and do these rituals, and you're clean, and you can keep... And, and the idea of, of being clean once for everybody, right? One of the criticisms Christians have is you have to repeat these sacrifices all the time, but Jesus died once and it's all done, so it's better. Um, and again, the, the Jewish concept would be you don't wash your clothes once and think that you're better forever. Washing is a constant process that you go through and keep yourself clean, right? You have to wash yourself over and over again. These rituals wash you. These rituals keep you clean, and you repeat them. That doesn't mean they're less powerful or less good. That means that's what it takes to keep yourself clean, right? And there's nothing here about being perfect. It's about being clean. Again, uh, some of the things that make you unclean are childbirth. We have a list. Childbirth. There is no sin in childbirth, but childbirth makes you unclean. There's probably a good reason for this, because childbirth involves a lot of blood and bodily fluids that could potentially pass diseases. So you should wash. They don't know how long you have to do. They don't understand the germ uh, reference to disease. So if, so if it's a male child, you have to wait seven days. This is very repressive. We would say repressive for women. Menstruation is also makes you unclean. It's repressive for women in that sense. But in their sense, they're just trying to keep things clean, and they recognize that certain things cause their ick to go off and actually have potential to make you sick if you're not careful with them. Blood, menstruation, childbirth. Of course, if it's a male child, you only have to wait seven days. If it's a female child, you have to wait two weeks because women are, I guess, less or something, right? So we, no one knows why that is. But this story shows up in Luke where uh, Mary brings Christ to the temple to offer the purification offering of two turtle doves that she needs to make herself clean. It's not that Mary sinned. It's that Mary's unclean because she gave birth to a child, and, so, and that's a good thing especially in a fertility uh, religion like ancient Israel, she wants to bring these two turtle doves to make herself ritually clean again. So it's not, it's not sin. Leprosy. A leper didn't sin, but leprosy is contagious. And by the way, leprosy in the Hebrew Bible has to do with a, a variety of skin diseases, not this specific one we call leprosy today. It's, it's a broad range of skin diseases, but some of these are terribly contagious and incredibly frightening. They make your fingers fall off. They were terrified of these diseases. They had no antibiotics. They ran rampant, and they killed a lot of people. And so Leviticus has a long list of rules for telling if a disease is one of these diseases that are contagious, and then you're unclean. And what that meant is you're separated from the community because your uncleanliness is contagious. And if you're cured from your leprosy, if it goes away, you can go to the priest. He can look at you and say, yes, it's gone and then you can offer a sacrifice and be clean. And then you can go back into community. So communal connection, being around other people, is something you can't do when you're unclean. This is also why um, that incredibly moving story in the New Testament of the woman who had had, uh, in chapter 15, is sexual discharges, both um, you know, normal ones and, and uh, non-abnormal sexual discharges. In her case, she was basically had a, 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 bleeding, a bleed that was not normal menstruation and it lasted for years. And because of these ritual cleanliness rules that they were worried might make somebody sick, you know, uh, she was excluded from the community. She couldn't be around other people or touch other people. So that would be incredibly hard for her and probably unnecessary, we now, we now know, as we have a better idea of, of the germ concept disease. But I, I, I like to give ancient people a little bit of a break, given that they didn't understand some of the things we do understand, while still looking at it and saying, if you believe in biblical perfection, we would still have to do that because the Bible can have no errors, and therefore we would still have to treat women this way, and that would be incredibly repressive and unnecessary, right? So I want to be able to do both, give the aged people a bit of a break, but also say, we wouldn't want to do this, this would be repressive. But can you imagine what her life was like? And so this moment in the story where she touches Jesus, something she's not supposed to do, and she's cleansed, and she's healed. This, was, this would have been this very moving moment. And that moving moment is lost if we don't have the cultural context 
that came from Leviticus 15, so where we would have known what her life would have been like because of her uncleanliness. Um, so again, knowing the, the, the Bible helps us uh, understand some of these stories, knowing the, ancient, the, old, knowing the Old Testament helps us understand the moving elements in the New Testament. So as conclusion kind of to this section, notice this weird dichotomy. Blood, especially discharges, uh, and even normal sexual discharges, semen makes you unclean, but, it, but you can also have weeping from the male genitalia. This is not, you know, the average Bible study you have with your kids, but chapter 15 is all about, you know, weeping from the male genitalia or the female genitalia. Those things make you unclean. Um, blood can make you unclean. Death, touching corpses, makes you unclean. But notice the way you get clean. You kill something and use its blood, almost like a detergent. So, there is this uh, strange dichotomy in the text where that which makes you unclean is used in a ritual way to make you clean. Almost like the thing is becoming unclean on your behalf. Almost. Uh, the substitutionary idea. Um, almost like the blood is a detergent. We see that in, in Babylonian rituals that we will talk about next time as well. Uh, so there is something going on there that I can't quite put my finger on all the implications, but there's something about using the unclean thing to make yourself clean that's going on. And it reminds me vaguely of Vajrayana Buddhism, where they talk about using a thorn to remove a thorn, understanding desire and using desire to remove desire, uh, where they have rituals uh, where they do things that would otherwise make them unclean, like eating meat, in a way to make themselves clean and attain it enlightenment. Uh, there's something like that going on here and there's something important about that in human psychology that I'm still trying to find a good way to express in a few words instead of hours of repeating the same thing and trying to make sense of it which I sometimes do but there's something going on here that's that's incredibly relevant and important and I'm not sure I quite understand it um, let me quickly show you what's coming chapter 16 is the day of atonement some of these unclean things permeate the tabernacle and in fact permeate the Holy of Holies itself. The Holy of Holies is so pure that you don't go in there because God is in there and, and you might, you know, it's like Icarus flying too high to the sun, you know, it might burn you. But once a year, the high priest can go into the Holy of Holies and clean it. It needs a cleaning, but it needs not, not a physical cleaning. This is a ritual cleanliness, cleaning from ritual impurity. And the Day of Atonement is, the, is what modern Jews call Yom Kippur, the most holy day on the modern Jewish calendar. And anciently it involved this ritual, which is described in chapter 16, which we will discuss in detail, which is about how you cleanse the Holy of Holies and how the high priest cleanses the Holy of Holies once a year. Uh, this is, uh, let me skip to here. Um, and as we cover that, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna compare that ritual to the daily ritual at Karnak. This is a yearly ritual, but the reason it's compared best to a daily ritual at Karnak is because in Karnak, the priest entered the Holy of Holies every day. In Israelite religion, you enter the Holy of Holies once a year. But these rituals are synonymous because in both cases, the priest is entering the Holy of Holies. So we'll talk about the ritual in Egypt wherein the priest entered the Holy of Holies, and we'll compare it to the ritual where the Israelite priest entered their Holy of Holies. And we'll also compare it to a Babylonian ritual um, called the Akitu Festival, which is incredibly similar because they also will offer a, a goat and use its blood as, as, a, as a cleansing ritual. And this is a Babylonian yearly ritual wherein the temple is cleansed of the impurity of the people, just like the Israelite temple. So we'll show you the rituals around Israel that probably created the cultural milieu from which this Israelite ritual came. So that's what we will do uh, next month. Uh, after that, we will cover the Holiness Code, which is the last half of the book of Leviticus. Um, the Holiness Code seems to have a different source than P. There is a difference in authorship or tradition. There's some of the laws will contradict. We'll go through the laws in P and in H, and we'll compare them and show how they contradict. And we'll try to show the reasons we have for thinking that there is a slightly different author. Um, H is related to P, though. Like, if you remember, orig originally, people noticed the difference between J and E because J used Yahweh, E used Elohim. Then they noticed the difference between J, E, and P because P had this priestly stuff and J, E had this other stuff. And then they noticed that there was something different going on in the book of Deuteronomy where it seemed to have its own authorship. 
And then there's this concept that the first half of Leviticus seems to be by P. The second half seems to be different. It's, it's like P, but it's slightly different. And so maybe, maybe, this is, this is a little less certain, maybe there's a slightly different tradition here, which we will call H, that H and P are kind of related, but, but slightly different. So in that two months from now, we'll cover H and talk about what makes it slightly different, how it's different, why, uh, et cetera. Um, this is an example. Uh, one of the things that shows up in H is that infamous passage about man shall not lie with another man as with a woman. This is the, the, the gay, uh, homo male homosexuality is wrong. It doesn't mention female homosexuality and it calls it, quote, an abomination. And so this is something that I promise to cover in great detail. We'll talk about it. We won't shy from it. Um, we'll talk about, you know, what, what its implications are, probably where it came from, what it means. But for now, this is, um, this, uh, what I've got a picture of here is from uh, Strong's Concordance. This is, uh, Strong's Concordance is uh, uh, relative to the King James, because this is what I got originally. Um, but one of the things, what it does that's useful, if you can see it here on the left, it's got every uh, verse in the Bible that uses the word in English in the King James, abomination. But then what it has on the right here is, is, is the, the, the place it's at, and what it says, and then these numbers. These numbers refer to a Hebrew dictionary in the back. So if you don't know Hebrew, you, it's really hard to find a Hebrew word in a Hebrew dictionary. But if, it's, if they're all numbered, it's easy to find them. Uh, the other, so this is a good way to get, um, I showed this when I first introduced the Bible. This is a tool that is really useful. If you get one of these concordances, it can really help you. Um, because it allows you to get some of the Hebrew insights without knowing Hebrew. And just look at this. The first thing you can notice, Leviticus, when it uses the word abomination, you get 8263. Right up till chapter 11 and chapter 18 and 19, you get these references to homosexuality, and suddenly it's 8441. Uh, the first thing you notice is that when the first half of Leviticus, P, uses an abomination, it uses a different Hebrew word. Even though they're both abomination in English, there's a different Hebrew word in P than there is in H. This sort of thing is what immediately tips us off that H is a different author, right? because he's not using the same words for things. And there's a whole list of words like this that are different. And you can immediately see the, the, the break, see? Same number, same number, same number, suddenly break. And where's that break? Right at the break between P and H. And notice Deuteronomy uses the same word. H has something in common with Deuteronomy uh, that P doesn't. Which, just this one picture, um, describe something that we will later describe it in all sorts of, of biblical scholarship and, and questions about authorship and, and influence. H is influenced by Deuteronomy, P is not. Uh, a lot of that can be seen in just one picture. Uh, what is also relevant though for us is that P's reference to abomination has something to do with ritual impurity. No reference to ethical issues. In Deuteronomy and H, uh, there is a ref an ethical component to the term abomination. And what it really means is things that make you go ick. It, it, it feels icky. So to this person, homosexuality felt icky, so it must be ethically immoral. And I know that, that, that one of the things people like to do to talk themselves out of this is the first half here, well, this is all ritual impurity. So, so that's what's happening here too. So it's just a ritual impurity thing. We don't have to worry about it. There's nothing wrong with homosexuality. And I've even said that sort of thing. It's a, it's a good argument. If it helps you, great. But I think if we just look at kind of what's happening, I don't think that's actually right. Uh, I think what we're really dealing with is uh, a, 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 an ancient tradition uh, with ancient morality that makes all sorts of mistakes, which we've just described, like what is contagious and when is a woman really unclean and when should we separate. Like, we don't have to agree with them about everything we think is ethical or right or wrong. And that's true whether you believe in God or not. Because we can see, I believe, in this text and in these texts, an arc where we move towards ever greater understanding and alignment with the heart of God while preserving these ancient attempts for people to understand God and their connection with God. And so if you're, if you're agnostic or an atheist, 
you learn something about our history by looking through these texts. And if you're a believer in God, you can maybe see God influencing the moral arc of the universe towards greater understanding. But we can do that without feeling either that we need to explain away the text and not take it seriously and say, oh, well, it's not really saying that there's something ethically wrong with homosexuality. We don't have to do that. We can just say we, we don't agree, right? That because we've learned more about what it means to be a good human being and we're not bound by every tradition of an ancient people, even if they were doing their best, even if God was even guiding them. Uh, so again, no matter what you believe, I think we can find ways to take the text seriously, understand it in its own context, and still be ethical people who have compassionate hearts and are willing to change our minds as we learn more about what it means to be a good person. All right, so there's our plan for Leviticus today. Next month and the following month, we'll do the Day of Atonement. Then we'll take the Holiness Code in its entirety, and we'll, we'll dive into that passage about homosexuality again. Uh, I know I did most of it just now, uh, but we'll, we'll do that again. If you're looking for good resources, um, I mentioned this in Exodus, Pete Ruins Exodus. Uh, he's, he's got a book called Pete Ruins Exodus and several episodes of a podcast called Pete Ruins Exodus in the podcast, The Bible for Normal People. But he also has one episode on, on Leviticus, he said he, he thought about calling it Pete Rescues Leviticus because it's already ruined for most people. Uh, but he said, no, he's going to stick with brand uh, consistency. So it's called uh, Pete Ruins Exodus, Season 6, Episode 209. A lot of my material, I admit, came, came from him. Uh, he's got great, great uh, text for, for just understanding this book if you're a beginner. Uh, and, and some of these things are complicated, and he helps us through them. Um, the Bible with Sources Revealed, I've referenced this before. This is a great text that just has the, the first five books of the Bible color-coded based on who wrote them. It doesn't help us much with Leviticus because it's all P and H, but um, this is a great way to kind of separate the sources in, in Leviticus, um, or, or sorry, in, especially in Exodus and Genesis and Numbers. Um, there are two uh, volumes of a really great commentary on Leviticus that I used uh, a lot by Jacob Milgram. He's a very good scholar. He's written a lot of great stuff. Uh, Leviticus 1 through 6 and, one, and 17 through 22, broken up between P and H, you'll notice. Um, and this is from the Anchor Bible, Bible Commentary series. They're expensive, but I think you can get a lot of them in the library. You can order them in if you'd like. Um, and and I, I didn't have this listed, but this book, uh, Sinai, An Entry into the Jewish Bible by John Levinson. This is also really good, um, and I'm a big fan of this one. It talks a lot about you know, the extension of Mount Sinai to the tabernacle and the extension of that to the land, which is a core concept which we'll see again in H, especially, where the whole land becomes holy. And he talks about that in this book. So these are great resources you can use to learn more about um, Leviticus. This is the concordance I was using. It's a King James. I think they have equivalent concordances for the NRSV, but I'm not sure. But Strong's was one of the first people to, to kind of do this, to go through the Bible and put every word into a concordance so you can find every reference to every word uh, and then find out what the Hebrew was. And this lets you come up, like I said, with the Hebrew insights without knowing Hebrew. Uh, and so that, that's very useful. And find words in the dictionary again without having to, to know the Hebrew. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, are there any burning questions? And then uh, I'll see you next month if there aren't. Any, any thoughts, comments, questions? Can we email you? Yes, okay. please. I'll see you next month then. Thank you. Have a great day. So we were talking about cleaning and using something unclean.